Chapter 27, The Pump, Ever Seeking Variety in the Search for Fortune, I moved camp for the time being to Flaggy Creek, a few miles farther along the deep lead. Here, for some seven miles along the lead, scattered working parties were toiling to unearth fortune from the old river bed. Deep beneath the basalt, abandoned shafts and tunnels stretched for some miles where fortunes for those days had been won in alluvial ten during earlier years. The men working here now were toiling under appalling difficulties, dangerous ground, drift underground water to contend with, Generally, the shafts and every foot of tunnels and underground workings had to be securely timbered, which is an expert's job. Labor and precious time be expended in felling the timber, cutting and shaping it, transporting it to the claim, then erecting it to hold up the often broken, sometimes rotten, basalt roof and to hold back the seeping in of the walls. Especially careful work was needed against that treacherous drift. Drift is pure, packed sand which in places lies many feet thick on top of the gravels of the old river bed. This fine sand, of course, is the remains of mountains washed away by great rains millions of years ago. What a buffeting from the elements this old continent was forced to battle through when all of us were but a thought in our maker's mind. When working underground with this seemingly harmless drift overhead to tunnel on through the old bed without using timber, meant the day would surely come when, in a second, tons of smothering sand would pin you to the tunnel floor and bury you as a falling sand heap would bury an ant. Broken rock from an insecurely timbered roof can fall and crash you to death. Drift can overwhelm you as an avalanche and smother you to death. An inrush of subterranean water can dash you into darkness, struggling for your life. Such awful deaths have happened on many a mining field, added to such risks, foul air. The tin miners had found on sinking shafts that tapped the center of the old river bed that in many places there was water at the bottom, which, when it grew too strong to be bailed or pumped out, would creep up the shaft so that all their labor and time would be gone for nothing. Thus nature against man again, grimly ready to maim or kill him, should he, unwittingly or otherwise, break one of her laws. Though millions of years ago the volcanoes had sealed up her riverbeds with molten rock long since solidified, she still had water, and often slowly running water, imprisoned down there deep in the darkness, disturb its course, and surely though, perforce slowly, it would fight against man and find its own level. Little wonder that many a miner has bitterly thought with at long last fortune seemingly within his grasp that a living implacable nature was dead set against him. Nature hides her secrets well, protecting them by immutable laws to try to overcome this both dangerous and apparently insuperable water difficulty, groups of miners as mates had driven and were driving tunnels 
where the level apparently allowed, that is, where nature seemed to allow a chance from a way back outside the deep lead to come in under the old river bed and thus drain away the water. The labor and skill involved and the chances against success were sometimes almost insuperable. The men had the hearts of lions, so we say, but the heart of a lion with everything on his side and freedom to run away when anything goes wrong is a puny thing indeed to the heart of a man. Some of these tunnels in those days of the pick and shovel were hacked through solid rock for considerable distances. The Herberton Ten Syndicates Tunnel was 3,000 feet long apart from numerous side drives. Maslin's Long Tunnel was half as long. Years earlier, Masterton's party had driven a tunnel 3,000 feet in under the deep lead. A tremendous task without modern explosives where mates were working, they had to labor on their own, for there would be no payment until and if they struck ten. Maslin's party alone had done two and a half years necessary dead work without a shilling return in payment, and it was in such instances upon all these scattered mining fields that men like John Moffat and Jack and Newell gave unstinted aid. For on all fields most storekeepers stuck to many such ventures with Tucker for the families too. If the men were married, the storekeepers were paid immediately if such a party struck it. If not Ah, well, I doubt whether miners and storekeepers would or could work under such handicaps today. The Queensland Mines Department was now giving aid to drive a tunnel that it was hoped would drain a large area of the old lead. Whether this was eventually successful or otherwise, I do not know. In desperate attempts to beat the water when it defied all the slavery of man and horsepower, some ingenious homemade expedients had been used by the old hands from the bush made Archimedes screw and endless buckets to the weirdest of pumps. The heavy, clumsy machinery of those days was not like the efficient, compact little pumps of today, of course. Besides, the battling alluvial miner could seldom afford such expense. For the treatment of the wash dirt also, in cases where its gluey, clayey, or cement-like nature defied ordinary attempts to extract the tin sands, Ingenious, homemade machines were devised. Some among those quaint makeshifts proved actually to be forerunners, models for portions of extraction machinery in years later. Strangely enough, 3,000 miles southwest on the waterless gold fields of western Australia, the Bushman prospectors with a tomahawk, a few sticks of mulga, a bit of hide, cow, horse, or camel, a strip of tin or a sheet of bark, were devising that remarkable dry blower, their machine, to extract alluvial gold from dirt in places where water at times was worth its weight in gold. But in the deep lead in Herberton, as in many other mining fields, the underground water was a curse. In tin mining, 
as also in gold mining, we used to declare it a cussedness of nature that in one area ground would be richly payable if only we could get the water on, yet in another area water could be a curse, especially underground water. One machine of the old timers was a local classic. Throughout the bush for a hundred years and more men had been noted for getting along with a tomahawk, a sapling, a length of raw hide, and when modernity dawned, a bit of fencing wire. But this machine really was a museum piece, a pity it could not have been preserved to amuse, also to instruct in human ingenuity or atomic electronic wizards of today. Its base actually was machinery, a very ancient, long-discarded, rust-eaten boiler that originally had come from goodness knows where. When they had patched up its holes with plates cut from oil drums, tarred it and rawhided it, and bound it round and round with wire to strengthen it, they upended it onto its platform, where it stood like a prehistoric toadstool. Homemade steam pipes were fitted into it, and to give these pipes strength, each was securely bound round with rolls of stringy bark. Just as, but much more tightly than a soldier would bind putties round his leg, as the live bark dried, so it contracted and tightened round the pipes like a vice. Perhaps you know the power and the awful uses it has sometimes been, been put to of raw bullock or camel hide bound round an object, then left to dry and contract in the sun. Thus those pipes were greatly strengthened so that the bush engineers knew more than appeared on the surface. By the way, these particular engineers were Ravenswood blokes. Men from the Ravenswood side had quite a name as engineers across on the Herberton side. The ancient boiler was now treated similarly, completely encased within sheets of stringy bark. To all outward appearance, the boiler was now a boiler made of stringy bark. Maybe for this particular job, it was the only one of its kind in the world. This boiler had to raise and withstand the ne necessary pressure of steam to provide the power to work the plant. The local men made quite quiet wagers as to how long she'll last before she blows up, and all were on tiptoe, awaiting the great day to see her bust. The plant itself was quite a good-sized concern, actually a puddler, separator, and tube mill, and a good head of steam would be necessary to operate it. The accessories, too, were all homemade. Well, she did not blow up. She worked, more or less, in a rattling, hissing, shaking, groaning, agonized fashion at times, as if working up, up to one last bang in a cloud of steam and flying debris to the, to the skies. But it never happened. She groaned away at her job for quite a time, until at last the underground water beat them, but they had raised a lot of rich wash, and managed to put it through, and had done quite well out of it. Finally, the underground water flooded the workings, and engine and plant sobbed themselves to quietness, a last quietness abandoned to the bush. But what a museum piece that stringy bark boiler and plant would be today. Not possessing the inclination or the wherewithal to settle down to such long periods of dead work. I set to with my own machinery, 
pick and shovel and elbow grease, ten scratching and a creek bank to overcome the one worry of that interesting, happy-go-lucky Tucker money. I missed old Mick's campfire. It was pretty lonely for a young fellow of evenings. His only company, the candlelight and the peeping stars outside the open tent door, the bush quietness dreamily sympathizing with his feeling that he really was still a little love sick, though ever so hopelessly. About a quarter of a mile down in Creek Long Stewart, who used periodically who used periodically to come to Nigger Creek to do the communal ten streaming had his claim. I'd stroll down there for a yarn some evenings, but not often, for Long Stewart regularly toiled a shift and a half, ten hours for himself, then four hours every evening, knocking out a bit of dirt for his father-in-law. The father-in-law, Stewart, had explained almost apologetically, has a heart. To me, it seemed it was the son-in-law had the heart and a mighty big one. On my visit, I walked down the creek and stopped by the little tunnel mouth. It was visible as a faint glow up in the creek bank, the glow coming from the candlelight some forty feet back in the tunnel. In the quiet night, very distinctly came the steady methodical muffled thud 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 from the pick away back in there. Curiously, I hearkened to another sound, a much softer sound, but quite as distinct and clear, thump 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 thump, like the, can the candlelight confined within that little tunnel. The sound could find no way out except along the tunnel walls and through the mouth where I was standing. Stuart must have a pump in there, I thought, wonderingly, but why he's working above water level. At my call, he stopped work and said, Come along in, Jack. He always welcomed this chance of a pipe and spell. I crawled in, and we settled down for a yarn and smoke. He was dressed only in a dungaree trousers and the little white miner's cap to keep the dust from the roof falling into his hair, and his body was caked in sweaty dust. You're toiling pretty solidly, aren't you? I asked, doing two men's work. Oh well, Jack. He said quietly, the old man can't do too much. I give him a bit of a hand to help him keep the tucker bag full. Hmm, I gazed curiously along the tunnel. Do you know, standing out there, I could have sworn you had a pump in here. I was certain of it. He said nothing for a moment, just sat there looking at me, his eyes tired in the candlelight. Then he said quietly, Yes, Jack, there is a pump working in here, my heart. Each evening afterwards, when I visited him, I'd stand a while listening at the tunnel mouth, and always the pump was pumping dreadfully hard, it seemed to me. Of course, in no time, an eager curiosity took me exploring those long tunnels, very different from the short little tunnels of Long Stewart and myself, where we sat cross-legged, swinging our picks at the face, the roof only an inch over our heads. These tunnels you could stand up in, of necessity, for huge bulks of timber had to support roof and sides. Every foot was timbered, boxed in, to hold back treacherous roof and sides from squeezing down together and obliterating the human insects boring their way in. Then, too, the tunnel must be roomy enough 
for the truck line and loaded trucks that carried the debris dug from deep within to be wheeled away out and dumped under the blessed open skies. Often there was the pit-pat, pit-pat of monotonous water drops dripping heavily from the roof. Running along the floor on one side of the tunnel was the drain with its whispering running water coming from the old river bed, far away in the darkness ahead, chilly dampness, smell of wet timber and dank earth, the candlelight casting dim, eerie shadows upon the timber, and around Long Stewart's stooped form as he trudged steadily ahead, the old river bed far away and there fascinated me for in the workings so much was exposed. After all these millions of years, it felt like a dead world too, this cold blackness of the tomb pressing around us against the frightened little candle flame. Every here and there, cross drivers and large chambers had been dug out where the wash dirt had been rich in steam stream 10. In the dim light of candles, one portion was a devil's canyon of mighty boulders glistening with water, and wedged amongst them the compressed masses of water stones and gravels and sand of this vast old river bed. Slushy water underfoot was sucking and gurgling its way to escape away back down the tunnel, but in places what had once been an enormous water hole was below the level of the tunnel floor, and here the water could not escape, and in these places all the wash dirt possible had been most laboriously and uncomfortably dug out by long-handled shovels, the men working to their waists in the black icy water, how deep those holes went, what riches of ten might lie on the bottom, impossible to work, no man could, ne could know. In one place, tunnel and shafts had proved that the ancient riverbed was half a mile wide at least. What a difference between the prehistoric wild river to the wild river of today. Even in a heavy wet season, the wild river of today let it roar its foaming song its hardest would be but a tinkling creek in the inferno of waters of that wild river of the past as it battered into fragments mountains to which the ranges of today would be like hills and to think that this was only a fragment, for it had been proved now that the deep lead was but a part of one river alone of some vast river system. One day I found myself alone in such a place, not then experienced enough to understand the risks, though the chilly loneliness, the black depths all around grimly hinted at it, no crouching figures illuminated by candlelight away in at the face of drives worked here today. No scraping of shovel, no rumble of truck coming from far away down the tunnel. Here was an awesome silence emphasized somewhere by the steady drip of water, a ghostly loneliness, a black cavern in which my one feeble candle was barely reflected from the black gleaming sides of huge boulders, black mouths of side tunnels, compressed masses of ancient river gravels, and gray bulks of upright timbers, which I would instantly remember in later years, when a candle was lit in a burial chamber of the pharaohs and a gray line of mummies took ghostly form. On that day, when we 
prowling soldiers broke into that underground burial chamber in the Valley of the Dead and lit the candle, in a flash I was back under the Herberton Deep, lead staring at those shadowy bulks of timber. Strange indeed at times is the flashback of memory in the mind of man, but now I dug the candle spider into an upright, sat upon a fairly dry place, and sought to see around as far as possible. I must not lose my sense of the direction of the main tunnel. Awful to get lost in these black drives. I hadn't given it a thought. What was it the jungle man had said? He who uses his ears hears things. He who uses his eyes sees things. Why on earth was I thinking of him, thinking two strange thoughts that came flooding in when I was working down in my own tiny claim by Nigger Creek? Sounds were growing, the drip of water so close, and other drips quite far away, yet so distinct. Then came every now and then a whisper, and now a long shuddering sigh that brought me up alarmed. Some distant bulk of timber had groaned under the strain of helping support those millions of tons of rock pressing down from above. Why, the whole cavern was whispering plainly too. Away in the black side drives, all these stout timbers straining in their task to hold up the mighty roof that was pressing down to fill in again this huge cavern gouged out of the old river bed. This was nature working, nature ever against man. I could smell it now, too, the clammy smell of seeping water everywhere, the smell of moldering timbers, the dank, earthy smell of these cold boulders, these shadowy masses of solid, this disturbed wash dirt, the jungle man had been right. Splash, and I jumped, though instantly realizing it was only a slide, the falling of some fragment of wash dirt into a pool. There was dangerous ground close by. For quite a time I sat there, while the candle beamed without a flicker in the motionless air. And as the jungle man had said, things came to me. If only a man could keep a receptive mind, I'll swear the spirit of the river came to me. All those faint sightings and whisperings and moanings took form as if the song of the great river had been overwhelmed and crushed and sealed off from the skies by the land but was still moaning for life under its imprisoning walls of rock. The tunnel, coming deep under the ridge, had opened the old bed up at this one little spot and let in the faintest of light and air again. And its choked voice was whispering away down the tunnel in awakening reply. Could these whisperings be magnified? there would burst out the voice of a river, as in the open air. It was a most strange experience, until a sudden grinding, ending, almost in a shriek, scared the daylights out of me. I snatched at the candle and made for the tunnel and escape. That splintering rock told so loudly of the rock masses above, pressing down upon the straining timbers, to imprison yet again the whispering river and me. Chapter 28 The Death Adder During our evening yarns in Long Stewart's wombat burrow, under the creek bank, he held me spellbound with accounts of the remarkably rich tin won in those tunnels and shafts in the places where men had been able to work the old river bed. 
bore the bottom wash dirt was often black with stream 10, 40 pounds to the yard was common. What a fortune today. Like shoveling up black sand jack, said Stuart dreamily, in the ocean mine particularly, there the wash dirt was almost fit to bag fifteen hundred weight of ten to the yard. Yes, Jack, Stuart smiled at my amazement. Makes my mouth water, too, just at the memory of it. Three quarters of a ton of stream ten to every yard of wash dirt in one patch. Seventy-five pounds worth of ten at the present price in every yard of dirt. It would be a rich gold mine, indeed, that would give a return as juicy as that. You can guess how they slaved night and day under heartbreaking difficulties to get out all the wash dirt possible before the whole place fell in on them, for the lead there was really a little ocean of underground water, with pipes alight, Stuart's chest gleaming, with sweat beads under the candlelight, we would sit and meditate on those rich finds. One evening I asked him to tell me some of his own adventures. Oh, I haven't had any, he answered in surprise. You must have, you were in at the opening up of this country, and what a tough country it must have been but a very few years back with all sorts of things happening, prospectors finding new mining fields, timberlands, new country, new rivers, wild blacks, new ranges. Come on, tell me some of the things that happened to you. He passed his hand over his brow in a puzzled sort of way. But nothing much happened to me, Jack. I was just an ordinary knockabout bush worker until I got married in Herberton, I suppose. He smiled slowly. That was my one and only adventure. However, it hasn't panned out too badly. But nothing much else had happened. All has been in a day's work. I've been near drowned, crossing flooded rivers, like many another man. I was trapped, once under a fall of rock, lay there in the darkness, slowly being suffocated and pressed to death, until three hours later my mates dug me out. That was a close go. Once a black fellow near took my scalp off with a boomerang but then he'd mistaken me for another man who'd done him a bad turn. I tripped once when scrub cutting and was penned under a falling tree, but got away with that too. I've had a horse somersault head over heels and roll over me when galloping full pelt after the cattle. Oh, a few little things like that have happened, Jack, but it's all been in the day's work. Have you ever been bitten by a snake, I asked. Slowly, he took the pipe from his lips in a surprised sort of way. That's strange, he said. No, I've never been bitten by a snake, but what, but what makes you ask? Nothing in particular, but as nothing seems ever to have happened to you, I thought there must have been something. I'm not the adventurous type, Jack, he smiled. If I had anything interesting to tell you, I would, and willingly, but my life has been mostly hard toil, with very little pay, plenty of traveling, but mostly just trudging along, looking for a job. Then why were you so surprised when I mentioned snakes? With a half-smile of uncertainty, finally he answered, Because I'm the death-adder man. 
At my expression of surprise, he laughed, a pleasant laugh. I remember thinking, this man must be a real decent cove. There now, Jack, he said, you asked for it, and now you must think I'm a hidden terror of some sort. You won't come strolling along of evenings to have a yarn with me in the tunnel any more. What nonsense, I said eagerly. I'll never leave you alone now until I hear all about it. Come on, out with it. Almost bashfully, he began filling his pipe, speaking with a slow smile that reminded me of a recent schoolboy friend caught out in some mischief. There's really nothing to it, Jack, just the nearest chance, the merest chance. But wherever I've been, in death at her country and in season, of course, I've seemed to be always running up against the brutes, so much so that I've carried them about with me in my swag. Have you ever unrolled your swag at sundown, Jack, to find a big, fat brown sleeping death adder in it? I have not. It gives you a bit of a shock, he said, smiling, especially if you've trudged a good distance on a hot day all along a dry track. Of course, I'd spread the blanket on the wretched thing when I'd camped late, or else it had crept into the blankets for body warmth. In the morning, I'd simply roll up the swag with the, with the adder in it. It only happened a few times like that, of course, before I'd give my blankets a jolly good shake in the morning, and at nights, if forced to camp late, I'd light a blazing fire and examine the ground carefully before I'd spread the blankets. He paused, lighting his pipe, then said thoughtfully, Have you ever noticed how difficult it is to see a death adder jack? If you're not looking for them, I've only seen two in my life, and they were pointed out to me. You haven't started life yet, Jack, he smiled. There's a long track stretching ahead of you, a long and unpleasant and pleasant track, I hope. Anyway, the adders blend so well with the dull brown soil when the bush is parched or the dull gray. The short, squat devils lie utterly motionless, too, and they love to choose a pad to bask or sleep on. I suppose a well-worn pad beaten down by hooves of horses and hobnails of men collects the sun's ray rays by day and retains some warmth by night. Anyway, if ever you pick up the billy can after sundown, to fill it at the water hole, never go without your boots, or when you go visiting camps at night. On different evenings, I've stood stock still with one foot held up, then stepped smartly back, lit a match, and there was an adder lying there just where my bare foot would have trod. He paused, puffing thoughtfully. A man would be in a nasty fix, I said, if he was bitten like that and distant from help. I've seen a man die within a few minutes from death at her bite, Jack, he said. So don't forget those boots. I know it's much easier to walk barefoot down to the water hole than to go to the trouble of putting on boots. But before you do, so next time, just remember what might lie in wait for you. Anyway, they'll lie out anywhere in the bush, not only on a pad. That is, if you happen to be in adder country, of course. But if you've slept with a death adder in your blankets, you must have rolled on him in the night. Yes, and he's never bitten me. And more than once I've had one as a bedmate. You remember the fright you gave old Mick 
when he woke up with that old billy goat's snout under his chin, while I suffered a much worse fright than that when I woke up cold sober with a death adder asleep beside me. Then what is the attraction? I laughed, but I knew it was no laughing matter. Blessed if I know, he answered in a puzzled way. There's no attraction. I'm sure it's been just chance, just one of those things that happen. <clears throat> the trouble was that it happened to others too, when they spread their blankets beside me, and that's how you got the name. Yes, but Jack, only because of one particularly bad death at our season, as we called it, when a few of us were drifting through a dry district seeking work, and work was very scarce. Now don't you go and put me away to your friends at Nigger Creek, or I'll never hear the end of this. Worse than that, Mick, would be sure to write a poem about it. I promise not to be responsible for putting you in the annals of fame, I laughed. You put a billy goat in Mick's bed, he said dubiously. But I thought how cozy that would look sleep they would look sleeping together. I protested. Why the billy goat didn't like it. I had to wait until he was staggeringly drunk first. He couldn't even hold his head up. Hmm, he replied doubtfully. You get such bright ideas, Jack. I promise faithfully I won't breathe a word, I coaxed, and I'm real interested. Come on, tell me how the adders came to get into your friend's blankets, too. They just crawled there, of course, but why, I don't know. Once I was with a prospecting party way down south near Stanthorpe. Wonderful patches of tin were found there, too. Jack, by the lucky ones, there were ten of us. We had a big tarpaulin we used as a tent during the rains, but in dry weather, when traveling about, we merely spread it out on the ground, spread our blankets on it, and camped on it, used it as a mattress. One morning, on rolling the tarpaulin up, we found, to our uncomfortable surprise, a death adder jammed tightly beneath it. The beggar had been there all night and couldn't get away with our weight on the tarpaulin. Well, that was all right. You could be sure my mates examined the ground carefully before spreading the tarpaulin after that. But a week or two later, the same thing happened. So the adder could not have been there when we spread the tarpaulin and it could not necessarily have been the weight of our bodies that kept him there. My mates were very puzzled. Did you tell your mates about the little death adders, the death, death head's partiality for you? Would you like your mates to believe you a hoodoo man, Jack? He asked quietly. Only then did I see what a worry this strange thing had been to the quiet man sitting with his back to the tunnel wall before me. If you wake up and find yourself sleeping on or with a death adder, adder, more than once you grow more and more uneasy. He resumed, you begin to wonder if you'll wake up alive next time. I remember a mate of mine. He left his swag half-rolled up while he borrowed some tobacco from me. He was fed up, decided to walk out to a show back of Elsinmore in the morning and look for a job. That night he slept in the hotel at Elsinmore. No need to unroll the swag, of course. The next morning he was on the track again and at sundown unrolled his swag beside a lonely waterhole. To his horror, he found a death adder neatly rolled up in his blankets. He was a man afraid of snakes, 
Some men have an unreasoning horror of them, and this was a death adder. He didn't wait to boil the billy even, just filled it, shook out his blankets, hurriedly rolled them, and walked on all night. He missed the track. Stuart paused and sighed as at some unhappy memory. Oh well, Jack, the country then was very dry and a hot summer. They found him ten days later, but he was all in, perishing of thirst. In delirium, he was moaning about a death adder in his swag. He'd long since thrown it away, of course, but he thought it was still strapped to his back. He couldn't get rid of it. He must have raced around screaming in circles, trying to throw off that imaginary swag until he fell exhausted, then crawled away with that swag still on him. They managed to piece the story together, but he was too far gone. He died. He was a good mate.